Welcome to We Question and Learn. This is Tom Pies. We're celebrating our, well, into our 20th year here on the air at WQLN, and we're on about uh, a dozen other podcast venues, so the program has been well heard, and certainly we accomplished that task by having great guests. Today, I, I'm really honored. I have a, a very, very special guest online here, and Lindy Smart, what a great name. I You probably get that all the time. Well, when you come in intelligence, I think you got you to gotta rock a name like that, I think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd almost say you invented that just for the position, but I won't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's get serious. As the executive director of the Mercyhurst Intelligence Studies Program, you're celebrating, your organization is celebrating an anniversary this year, I believe. We are. So thank you, Tom, for, for this opportunity. Congratulations on your anniversary well, <laughs> as well with your 20 years. So big honor this year uh, to come in and lead this prestigious function. It's off of the work of brilliant leaders like Bob Heibel, who founded the program, Jim Breckenridge, who was instrumental in the growth of of the undergrad program and then building the graduate both in person and online, and incredibly dedicated faculty that knew their craft and dedicated their lives to the student and, you know, not just furthering intelligence here at Mercyhurst, but furthering intelligence uh, as a whole. And so it's kind of with <laughs> with both that, you know, like honor and gravity that, that I come into this role to be sure that I continue that legacy that's that's been built here. I remember getting a tour, uh, that's a bunch of years ago, so you can update me as to what's happening. But I was so impressed, but I also was educated as to what the concept of intelligence studies really means what it involves. I was flabbergasted by all the different charts on the wall. They were not what I thought they would be. Maybe they're still hanging there after all these years. Oh, yeah. Uh, the one with the uh, all the premiers and leaders of China in small print, little pictures on a giant chart. And I said, my gosh, there's more to the world than what we really understand. And maybe if you could give us an outline of how your, your organization works. What are you studying? I'm sorry. What what does it all involve? Immediately when people think about intelligence, they think of, of spies yes. or they think of, you know, crime shows on TV. And, you know, while, while there are, are spies, that is really a minimum of small amount of what actually is done in intelligence. So, you know, Tom, the, the chart that you saw, uh, you know, it's it's been replaced, but the same principles apply. And that is, it's a new chart now that's up, and it's yes. another student's project that shows, you know, a, a link analysis of a country and, and their stability. And so really, it's, you know, taking a leader's question, and it's, it's really about decision support for leaders. I think we know that, you know, on our own, think of how many decisions we make on, on our own in a given day. Now imagine that you're a higher ranking government official, you're a CEO of a company, you have to make decisions that are going to impact the livelihoods of people or, you know, whether people like live or die. And so mm -hmm. you want to have the best information available to you. And so the role of an analyst is to be able to take all that information that's available out there. I think, you know, from map to conversation to, of course, what you find on the internet to, you know, signals that you hear um, in the government. And you put Put all that together to be able to tell a leader very succinctly, this is what we need to do and why. And then it's up to the leader to take that information and, and make those decisions. So, you know, it it is as cool as the CIA and, you know, mm -hmm. like spying. And it's also as, um, you know, kind of everyday, but I still find exciting as, you know, finding where the next location of, of when I worked at, Tom, at, at Target, where the next note location um, Walmart was going to so um, very broad spectrum across, you know, national security, crime, law enforcement, and private sector, but it's really based in decision support and making sense of a lot of disparate data. What impressed me the most, and I was actually thrown off by it, it's not just government. It's actual, as you have come from a corporate environment, information is critical. Now I'm going to offer you a compliment. I've been able to talk to a lot of people on this program. When I went to your resume, I thought I had to pull out a dictionary or a corporate <laughs> <laughs> I thought I understood a lot over the year, you know, 20, 30 years in the corporate uh, risk management world. So we have some commonality there. And yeah. I looked at this resume and I'm, okay, I confess, 
flabbergasted. I, I actually hit a brick wall. Now, that doesn't mean anything to our audience, but what impressed me was that these are topics, these are critical areas of real life. Uh, tell us about your last career, if you would. Yeah. So um, I'm actually a, a graduate of Mercyhurst, which I'm, I'm proud of. So I grew up in Erie and got my associates in criminal justice uh, from Mercyhurst Northeast, mm-hmm. thinking I was going to go into corrections, but realized I was too sensitive mm-hmm. and <laughs> yes. I'd go home crying every day. Yeah. So then I went for English, uh, which I had had really wanted to go for for a long time. So went to school eight to two, then worked at the Barber National Institute three to oh, eleven. So worked fabulous. full time. School full time. Oh. oh my gosh, it was it was the best experience of my life. I absolutely. Maureen Barber Carey has been on the program. I love to have her on. The mission, the vision, and everything they do is. Yeah. Uh, they uh, are incredible. Yeah. Yes, good yeah. word, good word. So then I didn't know what I was going to do, and then I had a one of my English professors that was standing in her her doorway. And Dr. Riley Brown said, hey, Lindy, did you ever think about going to grad school? And that's all it took. I, I hadn't. But, you know, you know how good when you have good mentors, they just spark that in you. Then another professor, Dr. Uh, Hosey, suggested the Intel program. And mm-hmm. that was it. And so came in through the program. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Oh. And I think if you, you talk with other alumni, they'll say the same thing. But also, which I've heard other alumni say, one of the best decisions I've ever made. So I had a job lined up already before I graduated with Target and went out and with each role I had, I had, I got to build from the ground up and I don't know why they trusted a you know recent uh, grad to come in and help build a program, but they did. And so got to build their e-commerce fraud investigations program. And that was really about how online orders, you know, everybody started to order so much more online versus going in stores. You think of physical security, right? And you think of going into the stores or a police force and protecting transactions or people in the stores. My job was to create that from a digital perspective. And what was fun about that is I got to build relationships with international, federal, state, local law enforcement. I got to work with our competitors. So I got to, you know, work with Kohl's and Best Buy and Walmart to help build cases. It was really fun to kind of work together and understand, you know, what data is most important and how are they changing their their operations and how are we going to catch them? So that was Mm. cool. Uh, Like you, Tom, went over into risk management and this was a, a, a newer function at Target and I got to help build their strategic risk management. And, you know, many times companies, especially uh, publicly traded companies, are really thinking quarter to quarter. Of, of course, they're they're looking to the future, but that's their primary focus. Mm-hmm. And so I got to help think about what are those long-term term risks that that um, Target should consider. And all the while, I had, uh, I cold called (laughs) one of a a strategy manager at Target, just told him, you know, I think there's something that we could do with competitive intelligence. Um, It just wasn't uh, something that Target had had. Mm -hmm. And built business case after business case, he helped me refine the idea until seven years later, he brought me on board to to build that program. So um, got to build Target's first competitive intelligence program um, in their strategy department had great leaders great support to to really develop it into a world-class function and the big idea is you know well what did we do every day well it was really about again as a retailer target has competitors with grocery with clothing with you know hygiene items with toys and so you know it's not just you know, we had to watch other grocers. We'd watch all these other retailers. And so just mm-hmm. like I said, mm-hmm. that decision support, making sense of all those different um, competitors, who pose the biggest threat to our strategy, and what do we need to do to kind of uh, mitigate those threats in the future? A lot of fun. Well, I'm glad you think so. When you innovate things, <laughs> you're also susceptible to your competitors looking at you and going, maybe this is something that we should do. I believe the competitiveness is beyond just the storefront. Am I right? Yes. You're right. It's, you know, everything from, you know, the type of technology that you use, the services that you use, um, the type of customer service that you provide, um, the type of, you know, money, the tender that you accept, whether it's credit card or Apple Pay or Google Pay. Um, So there's so many, you know, things to your point, Tom, of it's not just about your products. It's about your whole value chain that competitors are always trying to get a leg up on. 
plus the fact you're benchmarking yourself as to how well you're doing. Now, let's get yes. down to business. You teach people how to do this, correct? How to do these kinds well, of uh, studies? Well, I teach a couple courses, but yeah, we I, we as a organization absolutely do. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's how I was able myself to build that at Target was because I learned it here. Right. Yes. And I believe you're the oldest of your kind or one of the first innovators of your kind in the academic world? Absolutely. First and the oldest intelligence program uh, in the world, which I think is, is pretty cool that that yeah. comes out of Erie, Pennsylvania. So uh, again, big credit to Bob Heibel's vision on that. And I, I think the big thing that, to your point of that, uh, of, you know, we are the first, we are still one of the only ones, even though we have about 100 different other universities that we're competing with yeah. that now offer this type of, of um, program for students, is that, you know, there's still other things that schools can't can't compete with us on that, that we're trying to keep that competitive advantage and you know spilling the beans now so they can after us. Yeah. <laughs> but, I was going to say one of the things that you're able to do is you have all the tools to be able to see what your competitors are doing. Yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and you know a big tool is the faculty that we have and, and our faculty have that applied experience which is great too so so we really do pride ourselves on having that applied experience both with our professionals um, coming you know uh, the faculty coming from the field whether it's CIA military um, enterprise risk management um, AML so we got great faculty that have a really diverse background and um, with that you know that comes their network and comes our network we have 1800 plus passionate alumni Mm. that come back and help you know, define the program for, you know, what's next, whether it's they come in to be a guest speaker, they're mentors to our students, um, they come back and teach, they uh, um, come back and give internships and job opportunities to students, and they help kind of say like, hey, this is the next big thing in Intel, we can't hire enough of this. And so that helps us evolve our program. So our network is definitely one of our differentiators. What kind of businesses do your students end up being employed by? A total point of pride, I'd say, is that you can kind of, you know, scroll through any government agency. So Mm. any of the, the 17 plus national security government contractors, federal, state, uh, international law enforcement agencies, um, and Fortune 500 companies, and you'll find our alumni there. I hope people heard what you just said, Fortune 500 companies. We're in a very competitive world. Your folks are almost critical to the operation of some businesses. Do you feel that way? I feel that way, and I I feel, you know, as I, you know, mentioned at the start is it's there's a sense of gravity there's a sense of honor um, with that because our students are going out to help you know these major national security agencies these major companies go out and and make decisions they're working with the c-suite they're working um, you know with top officials and so um, we take that seriously here to make sure that they get the best training um, even down to things like, Tom, you know, if somebody asks you a question, mm-hmm. you don't make up an answer. You say, I don't know, I'll get back to you. Yeah. And it, it seems simple, but it's, it's that way you're not lying to leaders yeah. that are then going to go use that information based on your opinion. Right. It's, it's um, you know, that level of, of training that comes here of, of all those different types of uh, what could happen and, and making sure that our students are prepared for those scenarios when they go out into the, the real world. Hopefully we're done with COVID, although it rears its head <laughs> here and there. I, Boy, I would love to just do a program on the study that you may have done on that as it affects education, business, anything else you deal with. What are your thoughts about this COVID epidemic relative to business and education? You know, I I think what's really interesting about it is, you know, At Target, I got to experience different points of crisis within the company. Mm -hmm. So a data breach, um, a failed venture in Canada, Mm -hmm. and going through COVID. And I think the distinction between the data breach and, um, you know, the the venture in Canada, yes, it had uh, effects on everyone, of course, if your card was breached. But that was an internal kind of, you know, uh, crisis 
Mm. This was an external crisis that affected not just, you know, one company, but the entire globe. And so if you're, again, like a major Fortune 500 company, you're you're trying to win the quarter. You're trying to yes. watch your competitors. You're trying to watch your metrics to make sure that you're gaining market share and, and again, that, that you're on top of your particular industry. And I think what COVID was, was this great moment of crisis where leaders, you know, didn't they needed different information than they had available to them at the time. And so they needed to know more, they needed better data, they needed to make faster decisions. Um, and it wasn't just at this point watching the competition, watching the growth of their market share. Um, it was these multiple crises. So you think of all the elements that went into it is for your human resources. They had to figure out how to get everybody to work, you know, immediately how to work from home. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how do you have that happen? But then there's long-term implications for that. So you, that's an intel question. Mm -hmm. What is the migration of the, the workforce um, and what will be the future of work? So you have those kind of like immediate needs and those long-term questions that are intel questions. We saw supply chain issues, right? Like mm -hmm. think of, you know, from cars to eggs right now to anything, there's, there's supply chain challenges. And so the immediate issue that leaders had to deal with it, that they weren't used to is their flow of product and how to get the product. And then long term, what's the business continuity to make sure that doesn't happen again? How do they diversify suppliers? Um, they were dealing with local, state, federal, different like laws. You you know, as as Target, um, there was one point where you had to close off the rest of the store except for grocery because mm -hmm. the rest of the store was considered unessential um and then protests watching protests happen um the economy of course always looking at the economy but now both recession and inflation and so you know leaders are used to dealing with all of those things but never all at once and so i think from mm. this moment of crisis came a point where all these teams that might have looked internally at their own data we're now looking at externally to understand the entire landscape. And so um, I think what I witnessed, what my peers at other companies witnessed in other industries was just this great moment of growth for Intel of not just watching competitors, but being embedded across their organization to make each function uh, more competitive. I saw a chart of a major retailer, 62 locations, where they put a dot on the store floor every hour of a person walking around. You know, you'd never think about yeah. that. And you could see yeah. what areas were most frequented, what's the area of biggest exposure, so to speak. It stunned me that they can gather this. This is the kind of thing that you help people do or educate your students to help people do? Yeah, and, and I think it's, you know, it's not to be creepy and, you know, yeah. watch what people are doing, but it's to take a step back and say, you know, what areas of the store or what times or, um, you know, uh, who are people interacting with to, to improve um, a particular aspect of the, the, of, of the store or, you know, um, just so many different types of, of data sets out there to your point to, to watch movement within a store or to watch traffic um, around the store to say, you know, hey, if, if we are, if Target's next to a, a gym, are we going to get more traffic or uh, is yes. it going to be better to be next to like a restaurant? So um, a lot goes into kind of, I think, both, you know, the, the technological and the psychological well, side yeah. of running the business. Oh, by the way, let's build a whole plaza while we're at it or build a facility. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And these things are somewhat, the consumer is somewhat not aware of this. When you get down to brass tacks, I could take a bottle of aspirin and determine how that helps me, deters me, where to put it, how to place it, product placement. I understand that big retailers actually charge for space, shelf space, rent, so to speak. Are these the kind of things that you folks get into? I, I'd say, yeah, and I, I would say that that's, that's pretty... Um uh, a mature business as far as understanding product placement and, 
you know, um, the the major like vendors like Nestle and Kraft get the best product placement on the on the store shelf. So mm. that was actually interesting to learn. But that's like core merchandising. Um, and what we see is, you know, it's it's if that's core to every store or every business, how are you going to get a uh, what are you going to differentiate against for those particular um, mm-hmm. companies? And mm-hmm. so that's where things like customer analytics starts to become more important. How do you how do you get that person to buy? Let's not say aspirin because we don't want no, them let's to not buy do more that. aspirin. No. No. <laughs> but like, how do you get them to to come back to your store and buy more socks from you as opposed to your competitor? And so, the, how do you build differentiators into the mechanics? of core retail, I think is, is kind of the, the differentiator now of, it's not just what product you have, because everybody has the same product, it's how do you build a better service, how do you build um, you know, that easiness for those customers to come into your store. It struck me with one product that suddenly all the shelf space, okay, it's there, but that's a billboard now. You have to yeah. walk by it, not just six across, but six shelves across. And the yep. it becomes a billboard to buy the product. What other types of businesses, anything unusual that comes to mind that you may have experienced or you have gleaned from one of your students as to what they do now that they're a graduate of the Mercyhurst Intelligence Studies program? That's a that's a great question. You know, I think I think what's interesting is just how either niche our our students can get, and mm. so whether it's you know um, within the supply chain and and watching for a particular product to flow through the whole supply chain, um, you know we do see people tangentially going into um, risk management. Mm-hmm. Um, or you know, uh, leading um, different functions within um, financial services. So tangentially, I think what's interesting is seeing how students take the skills that we teach him, them here and apply them um, to, to businesses even outside of, of Intel. I think what's interesting now is we're even starting to see um, uh, nonprofits um, uh, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. get into an intelligence um, especially when you know you are highly dependent on 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 donors or um, on grants, getting really smart about about yes. your funding sources and um, the next opportunity. So, I, yeah, it's Tom. You're hitting on something that's like there's so many different types of of opportunities, yes. and it can be even within a single organization. Um, I think what surprised me is going into the private sector. Every major company kind of operates like a city. Mm-hmm. They've got their police force, right? You've got mm-hmm. your um, protection. Mm-hmm. They have their, you know, government affairs team that's working with legislators for their um, product and safety, uh, or yeah, and and for certain laws to be pushed. You have the sustainability team. So think of like urban planning. Um, so. Anything within these major companies, I think, surprising to see um, all the different functions that that our students go into. And looking at Ukraine, when you start to maybe imagine what could happen in a big city in the United States, do you folks do, I call it catastrophe planning, risk management for that big disaster? Is that something in your course structure? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, one thing that we focus on too, not only in the classroom but also outside of the classroom, we have um, the Center for Intelligence Research Analysis and Training. We call it CRAT, mm. and part of that, that's another differentiator of our program, is that our students get to work on real life projects with real clients, and um, so they get paid like as a contractor to to work with our clients. Mm. And what we're seeing, Tom, to your point, is um, there are uh, companies that are coming to us to help them prepare for, you know, um, you know, climate change or yes. um, active shooters. Yes. And so it's, it's really evolving, too, with intelligence of not just what the data is, but, um, you know, your background in risk management, the planning aspect, scenario planning, and facilitating leaders through those different types of um, activities to say, how would you react in this situation? 
And I think you'll see leaders are starting to be more open to that because of what they experienced with COVID. How do I work through a difficult challenge and come out with a positive outcome? So our students definitely get to work on those type of scenarios. And also they work with, um, we work interdisciplinary. So we work with our cyber and data science team. Um, and so you can imagine too, mm -hmm. um, the cyber team leading um, a risk exercise on you know the the security of an infrastructure, and um, so we partner with them on that. So uh, yeah, that's a really fun one when you get yes. to kind of yes. you know take the, I mean I guess that's morbid, but a worst case scenario and and help people walk through how to make the best decision. Well, you're that. saving lives over the long run. Yeah. Or you're Absolutely. potentially preventing a huge catastrophe in a small space. Uh, this last question may throw you off. I'll leave it to you to answer <laughs> it. The interesting topic that's crossed into my purview in the last month intensely is AI. I'm sure you understand what it is. I'm sure you people study it and are aware of it. The concept of using AI to do risk management. What are your thoughts, even just generally, about AI as it applies to your courses? You know, I, I've i already had some students kind of show me how they're using ChatGPT, and, and I think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that you, I don't think we can fight it. I don't want to try to fight it and say, no, it's it's not good. I think, I think it's another tool in our toolbox. And, you know, what I mean is, as an Intel analyst, I mean, why not leverage it? But then you have to corroborate that information. Can you find that within within another source? And so if it helps speed up decision making, but you can corroborate it with other information, um, you know, I think it's just another great tool to use. And, and the best way that we can find, uh, you know, good uses for it, yes. um, especially, I think we also need to understand it from the perspective of how will uh, bad people use it. And yeah. what are all the, the difficulties with that so that we are well prepared and we don't have a steep learning curve when all of a sudden we're trying to combat it. So I think the more that we understand it, the more we are comfortable with it, the more that we can use it as a tool. I think also the more we can um, be prepared for um, other uses of it and, you know, again, train our students on how to negate that as well. We're talking with Lindy Smart, Department of Intelligence Studies at Mercyhurst University. Any last thoughts relative to where you see your department or this whole industry that you are in? Where is it going in the next two to five or ten years? I, just, I think it's just a really exciting time for intelligence at large. And I think it's because there's there's been this understanding of the need for better data and um for making stronger decisions. And so I think in national security, they are well versed in that. And so I think we'll continue to see strength in, in, in national security. Their major intelligence crisis came out of 9-11 and they've been able to, to um, grow and learn from that. And so I think you're just starting to see that um, with the private sector with them coming out of COVID. So I think there's going to start to be some greater convergence across national security through the private sector as well as, you know, shared best practices. I guess that's probably utopian, but the idea of, of how do we strengthen better decision makings as a whole. Um, and so I think especially in the private sector, we're going we're gonna to see growth um, within this field um, and more companies starting to, to implement it within their strategic function. So I think we're right at the point where, where uh, we can really start to, to harness it across um, the whole world. And I, I think it's just an exciting time for Intel. There may be some students out there that are interested in your program. What's the best way to find you? Yeah, well, I want them to come talk to me. I'd, yeah, I'd love yeah. for them to come spend a day with us here in the oh. program, come to a class. Um, they're welcome to come sit in a class. Um, I'll sit down and talk with them. We'll show them the link charts, Tom, that you saw here yes, and yes. walk through the building. So they, of course, can find um, our information on the, the Mercyhurst website under uh, Intelligence Studies, or if they Google Lindy Smart, they can get my email address, and I'd be happy to connect with them then. Lindy Smart, Executive Director, Intelligence Studies at Mercyhurst University. Thank you so much. It was the most educational half hour here. I do appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Tom. It was fun. 
Welcome to We Question and Learn. We're celebrating our 19th year here on the air at WQLN NPR. We're on about a dozen podcast venues and we specialize in having interesting guests. Of course we would. And I just had Lindy Jo Smart, who is the executive director of the Mercyhurst Intelligence Studies Program. And then it dawned on me, Bob Heibel, who is a specialist in this field. By the way, Bob, you're more than just a specialist. You founded the Mercyhurst Intelligence Studies Program, I believe. Am I correct? I guess you could say I founded it, yes. (laughs) It's uh, it's going to take just a few minutes to describe that, (laughs) Okay. if you don't mind. Actually, uh, it's an outgrowth of my experience in the FBI in uh, 1984, 5, and 6. I found myself as the uh, Deputy Chief of Counterterrorism for the Bureau in Washington, Mm D.C. And at that time... Uh, the FBI had just begun to uh, create a position on what they call intelligence analysts. And for the most part, um, they were very, very poor as far as uh, their research was not bad, but they were giving uh, the managers in the FBI really no active information, anything that would help them uh, do their job and meet their mission. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I was enrolled in Georgetown in the master's program thanks to the Bureau. And what I saw at Georgetown were the roots of what I thought were the basic foundation of a good analyst, uh, a liberal arts education. So that stuck stuck with me. And I was fortunate enough to be able to return to my hometown, Erie, mm-hmm. and retire in 1987. But that idea of, of liberal arts education uh, and intelligence analysts stuck with me. And uh, I teamed up with Bob Allshouse, a professor from Ghana, a good friend of mine. Yes. And, we, and what we did is we took a look at a curriculum that we could create using liberal studies as the foundation. And uh, we were successfully creating that model. And uh, we proposed to several institutions, uh, but the response was not overly warm. Hmm. Uh, that changed in uh, 19... 19- in 1991, I had a meeting with Bill Garvey, thanks to Alan Belavaric of the History Department there, and I proposed to them, to him that we create a program using the Liberal Arts Foundation uh, to generate a graduate qualified as an entry-level research intelligence analyst for government and the private sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, so-called intelligence studies programs existed at that time, but they were de- they were dedicated to national security, mm-hmm. and there was no, no no real analytical skills coming out of those programs for the graduates. Up until this time, if you wanted to be an analyst, you had to learn through government. There were there was no private entity that would teach you, give you the skills to be an intelligence analyst. Mm-hmm. So. That, that's how it came about, because uh, that meeting with Bill Garvey was very fortuitous. Uh, he was a real entrepreneur. Uh, Mercy Hurst I had, has a small liberal arts education program uh, school, offered just what we needed. It was a program that was low cost. We were going to be able to build on uh, what existed already at Mercy Hurst and, and build a solid foundation and develop it over a four-year period. So Bill said, let's go ahead. I'm going to put you in the history department. And uh, that's where the program was until uh, um, uh, 2004. You spent 24 years with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's a heck Mm -hmm. of a career. That came subsequent to all your academic studies. What prompted you to get involved in that? What, in the FBI? Yeah. Um, My father was the supervisor at the Federal Building in Erie. Oh. And the FBI agents there, people like Oliver Hunter, uh, had, had become our friends. And uh, we would socialize with them. And at that time, uh, the idea of being an FBI agent was very, very popular. I can remember going through my college, my high school yearbook at Prep 55, and there must have been 10 people yeah. in the yearbook that were going to be FBI agents. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was some motivation because... I, well, there was a television program that sort of maybe oh, yes. was not well portrayed, I believe. Actually, it was. It really? was pretty good. Oh, it was okay. pretty good. Pretty good according to the Hoover model, I would say. Um, 
I find it very difficult to, to judge things that took place 60 years ago by today's standards, <laughs> although many people don't. So with that, you're at Mercyhurst. You're putting a program together that's unique. It's original, and Lindy Joe Smart was just on the program with me, and it by far still is, as she indicated, one of the best, if not the best, in the country, if not the world. You're you're on the money. Uh, you're you're on the money, and um, the development of the program was not in solitude. Uh, mm. The development of the program came about because there was an audience out there that wanted wanted to have access to these these employees that could give them actionable information hmm. so uh i spent a great great deal of time away from merciers uh, on the phone on away from merciers uh, going around and talking about the value of the program i can remember interviewing one government um, official and he said where the hell have you been <laughs> why hasn't somebody done this before and we were the first, without a doubt. And then what we did over the next couple, over the next decades is we offered that concept to any other school that was you know, interested in it. You know. One thing else I'd like to mention is that today, in today's world, you you have the these uh, chat chatbots that are appearing a artificial intelligence. I am so glad you brought that up. Uh, that, the foundation of those is what is something called open source, public domain information. And when we started the program, uh, we had no access to classified information. So what we had to do is reach out into open source information and develop the analytical products from that open source information. And I, I can say that as, you know, as well as creating this program, we also created a recognition of open source, the value of open source information. In the early 2000s, uh, the Office of, Na Office of uh, National Intelligence sponsored a program uh, for the best open source product. Hmm. From And that went out, the challenge was out there for corporate America, academic America. Guess who took first place? Ah, absolutely. Mercy Congratulations. Mercy yes. Yeah, so. But it, it just... You know, to see how it's blossomed, open source, uh, it's it's that's really one of the positive positive side effects of the of my experience at Mercyhurst. Can we go back and talk a little bit about your career? In two thousand one, the Society of Competitive Intelligence Professionals honored you, gave you their highest recognition, the Meritorious Award. And then in 2006, you received a Lifetime Achievement Award in the topic that you just discussed, which, from my impression, was well ahead of its time. When you think about intelligence, the natural, the natural reaction is to think about national security. Mm. But actionable information is, is, is needed in every field. And the, the competitive the site of competitive intelligence professionals, mm -hmm. these were business professionals whose job was to gather intelligence uh, for their corporations. And uh, uh, one of the leaders of that group was a, was a formal national security officer hmm. uh, for the CIA. And he and I developed a very close relationship. And he was the head of corporate intelligence for a major, for a major corporation. And that relationship uh, continues today. So it's, and then also there's law enforcement, uh, law enforcement, in law enforcement, you have two different types of analysis. You have one which is called crime analysis. That's, uh, that's done to examine statistics being generated within a department. Number of burglaries, number of assaults, mm -hmm. uh, officer time, so on and so forth. And that goes to the chief of police. Law enforcement intelligence is looking outside the organization to identify threats that the organization potentially or actually faces at the time. The gang, for example, the gang issue here in Erie, mm -hmm. it's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. And one way it's going to be, it's being addressed is because the Erie Police Department now has an intelligence analyst. 
So this has permeated or expanded, as a better word, into the corporate world, as you just indicated. Right. Would you say most or all companies have folks that are professionally trained, maybe even have come out of Mercyhurst? Uh, I wouldn't say out of Mercyhurst, but uh, we have 1,800 graduates. Think about that. Yes. We started the first year, we recruited 14 students. 14 students to 1,800. It's and in the course of that period, example, in, in 2016, uh, we had over 450 students uh, in, seat, in seats and online, and that were part of the Mercier's program. So that's, uh, that's pretty significant. Other thing that I'm very proud of is that um, starting in the mid-90s, uh, we began to have a series of colloquia at Mercier's where we invited um for a three-day period, we invited people in from the media, uh, from the computer world, mm -hmm. from the corporations, from national security. And we brought them together uh, into a group uh, with a main issue. For example, in 1998, I think the main issue was open source, use of open source information. And these people came together and they loved it. They loved it because we, uh, Mercier's hospitality was great. We'd have a picnic and... I uh, actually had some booze that they did get to. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and what happened is that those colloquium, colloquia continued until 2004 and resulted in the, found, the founding of the International Association for Intelligence Educators. Mm. That organization still exists, uh, has uh, 400 members, and is worldwide. And they hold conferences in Europe now. They hold and they hold an annual conference. Next year, they'll hold a conference at Mercier's in recognition of, uh, of uh, 2004 and the anniversary. That's quite an honor. Obviously, you will be there. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> One way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, with that said, for a good number of years, what, since, say, 2016? Am I close? Uh, you've been on your own, so to speak. Right. You have your own company. Right. Can we ask what you specialize in? And I, I'm asking you that question because I'm curious. I'm curious to hear who's interested in in what you do. And obviously, they know what you do. Uh, maybe you can't describe specific examples. I, I, I can speak to it generally. And yeah, uh, yeah. My my little company is called Applied Intelligence Studies, and the goal of Applied Intelligence Studies is to help academic institutions to create intelligence studies programs mm. and uh, it, uh, I have added a number of clients uh, domestically and internationally and uh, yeah, it's uh, it keeps me it keeps me occupied maybe not all the time but it it's nice to have things come up now and then that you can satisfy now that we're in the middle of a indirect war so to speak I don't know what to call it I'll let you identify it on the military side do people come and still ask you questions? To me, of me? Yeah, or just uh, the field no. itself. Well, obviously, the field itself is in existence in the government. You have to remember that I've been retired from the FBI over 30 years. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. and that uh, my relationship with Mercyhurst ended in 2016. Um, I'm still the, I'm still a news fanatic. <laughs> when I get up in the morning over yeah. my coffee, yep. you know, I'm going out and looking at Hitting the websites to see what's to see what's going on. You know, the, the interest is still there, and I have still people that come to me and say, "What do you think?" And I, I value their questions. It sounds like you're primed to writing a book if you have not done so already. I have one uh, that I've been working on for fifty years, but mm -hmm. I just uh, I'm kind of worn out, quite frankly, as far as uh, the subject matter. With that, what other interest? Do you, I'm going to ask blatantly. What other interest do you have as you I think about all the topics you um, were faced with at the FBI? That's not an easy job. As you got into the collegiate world, the leadership role, mm. the innovative role, it's still a main part of your life. But uh, what else would you be interested in? And is it integrated somehow with your your old career? Oh, it certainly is. Uh, I don't know. If you're aware of it, I think the audience may be, but a uh, a woman by the name of Anna Belen Montes, mm -hmm. 
was recently released after serving 20 years in prison for espionage. Uh, she was the highest ranking. She was an analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, and um, her specialty was Cuba. Mm. And she had been recruited by, recruited by the Cuban intelligence services uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, books have been written about her. Several books have been written about her. But the one that's currently on the bestseller list is called Codename WREN. Mm. I've worked in this particular field for 25 years, mm -hmm. and uh, there's still the efforts of the Cuban government uh, relative to the United States and Puerto Rico uh, that have not been told. Uh, and uh, they can, every aspect of a suspense novel was contained in those activities over a 30-year period. Well, there's your book. There's my book. Uh, the, the, the challenge is uh, there's so much material and bringing together and, and putting it into a publication uh, is, is a challenge. Do you speak with Mercyhurst occasionally? I, I notice you just went to an event involving them. I, I try to assist Lindy Joe as I can. And uh, I'm in the process of identifying some of the older graduates, I mean, we, You'd be amazed at the positions that some of our uh, early graduates hold. Very high government positions, very high corporate positions. And uh, uh, we need to, Mercerus needs to reach out to those people, uh, not for money, but for their guidance and assistance. Yes. Uh, in, in assisting the program to continue to develop. I just got a, a message from a, probably a friend of yours uh, who I've invited to come on the program. He was on the program about, oh, I'm, we were talking 10 years. It's more like 15, maybe a little longer than that. And that was um, Jim Breckenridge, and he's moved on as well. But he was uh, an integral part of the intelligence studies program, I believe. Jim, I recruit Jim. Okay. Uh, and uh, Jim had just the background we needed. He was a retired Army officer, uh, had taught at West Point. He headed the world, headed the world history program at West Point with there. Uh, but Jim was the guy that needed to come in. And I've never been an academic. I am maybe an educator, but I've never been an academic. Hmm. But Jim had the organizational skills and leadership skills to, to further take the program to its next level, which was the master's program. And uh, yeah, you know, Jim was a wonderful partner, absolutely wonderful partner. And I'm 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 so for, happy for him and what he's been able to accomplish since he left Mercyhurst. Also, well, you and I go back to the same educational institute institution rather. Although right. I was on the smaller side, the State University College, but you were at the University of Buffalo. Did you back then ever have any inkling this is what your life would come to? I I like the idea of when I came out of the Bureau of, of Teaching. Uh, I had done training in the FBI. Uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the students. I enjoyed the interplay. I actually went, was accepted into a PhD program at, at SUNY Buffalo, and and I was in the process of working towards that when I had my meeting with Garvey, mm. and after that I just didn't have the time to, to proceed with the education. But uh, I've always been an amateur historian. I love history. Yeah, I love history and. Uh, I'm always happy to be around people who, who want to talk history. <laughs> oh, it, excellent. And, and you're welcome to come on and expound on any topic you care to. <laughs> Just let me know <laughs> what okay. your next project is. Where do you see all this in a few years? I'm going to ask that question because my son, who's a university professor, keeps throwing two letters up at me all the time, AI. And mm -hmm. I just saw an article today that was yeah. very, very scary about AI mm -hmm. and uh, personal identity. We're all concerned about our credit cards and other chips mm -hmm. wandering around out in the retail world or online. This concept today that I read was very scary. In other words, artificial human right. beings. What, what are your thoughts on this? Was this a surprise to you or was it something you folks were aware of for a long period I of time? I'm not a techie, um, and uh, but I've, I, I've followed AI development. But I feel that is, AI can also be a tool. Of, for example, in the intelligence field, um, using one of the chatbots 
to do a query to give you a foundation from which to work on a research project. Think about it as a tool. Uh, if if I were intel an intelligence leader at this time, I'd be creating a unit to uh, examine the various AI chatbots and be able to evaluate them mm -hmm. as far as their quality and also to be, teach my students to use them. Yes. It reminds me of a book that came out a while ago called Emotional Intelligence. I'm not sure machines are going to get to that level. Right. Do you see this as a danger, so to speak, considering that some people could possibly use this for nefarious uh, projects? Or, well, I, do, I think that the, developing one of these is a very sophisticated project. And now uh, your ordinary uh, villain isn't going to be able to do it. But uh, certainly at a national level, uh, you looking at North Korea, uh, Iran, or Russia, China, uh, they're, they're, they will be creating these. And uh, if they follow the normal pattern, they'll use them against the United States in one form or another. And hopefully we'll use that same technology to protect ourselves and our citizenry. You can count on it. I hope so, yeah. You have a huge insight because of all the number of years you've been involved in your career with the FBI and education particularly, and of course the Mercyhurst Intelligence Studies program. I was thinking, what's the next big thing? Is the intelligence study program, these programs, I know Harvard has created right. one. Where are they going? Or is it, this is it, this is the structure, this is what it's going to be like well, for the, the next decade? Studies, intel studies has become a, a hot item. Um, 20 years after I graduated from Georgetown, Georgetown finally created an Intel Studies program. Mm. But there are over 100 colleges and universities that now have intelligence studies and include them under an umbrella called uh, security studies. Mm. Uh, and uh, so uh, intelligence studies are not going away. But the, the, what people have to remember about intelligence studies is that what its goal is. If you're a decision maker, I don't care what organization you're in, if you're in with in, uh, Doctors Without Borders or the American Red Cross or whatever organization you're in, you need actionable information. You need to understand your organization, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your threats are, what your what opportunities are. And your intelligence analyst can do that for you. I'll tell you, once to give you an idea, of how the intelligence studies program caught on. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 2012, we would do an annual get together uh, to attract uh, providers for internships and employment. And at that time, we had a close relationship with Northrop Grumman. Mm -hmm. And they, they sent in a team of seven people to interview. They came in uh, like on, a, on, on a Monday. And they were there till Friday. And they went back to Washington, and that that Monday they made twenty-seven job offers. Oh. I had a, an, in another, and how you're perceived by the outside is so important. Because in 2014, I had a meeting with a partner from Booz Allen Hamilton, mm -hmm. and I made a presentation to him. And when I finished, he said, "We want to partner with you. We have 500 analysts." who need training in intelligence studies. <laughs> yeah, that tells you something. Now, now here I am. I'm, I'm Bob <laughs> Bible from Erie, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and a partner, a major partner in one of the largest consulting firms in the United States. Yes. Tells me that they want to turn to Mercyhurst to educate their intelligence analysts. It's a compliment it's, to the university and to you. It's, it's, no, it's and to the program. To the program. The compliment yeah. is to the program and the kind of graduates our program that our team our team was was providing and it was a wonderful team do you happen to look at what other universities are doing is there anyone i mentioned harvard because that's the one that came up the other well, day it seemed like they were just a notch below mercyhurst or, or just a notch in a, a different direction what are your thoughts on you've got some you've got some strong very strong programs out there university of texas as uh, right. under security studies, very strong intel program. And they've attracted a former leader at CIA that heads it. So they, they, people like that bring 
uh, an aura, aura with them when they come into the program. Uh, Citadel has a very strong program. Uh, James Madison University has a very strong program. And that, that program is housed by several graduates from the Mercy Harris program. Uh, Georgetown has a program. And that it's, now you look around and uh, the, the, the programs are, are all over. I hope there are some high school students or even younger that are hearing your message because the question, what do I want to do when I grow up? Well, you and I go back to, we didn't even know what was possible when you think about yeah. the space yeah, age that, and beyond. That was the beauty, the beauty of the program is that when, when I started, I wanted to recruit people like myself mm -hmm. who loved history and government mm -hmm. and geography and that's the pitch we made. Andy Roth was the head of admissions at Mercer at that time. Yes. He, he went out to people who were graduating from college, high school who had those interests. And that's why we were able to attract those people because we could tell them, look, you graduate from this program and you're going to be able to use those interests you have in your life work. It got to the point when people would come in and I, I would... I would interview most all of new students coming in and they'd bring their parents with them. And I'd say to them, you come into this program, you get keep a 308 average or better, and there's gonna be a job waiting for you that you're gonna love. And those jobs were paying 60 to $70,000 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one last question? I know a lot of folks, well, they're a little younger than us, let's say 40, 50, they've been exited from their careers, literally, their companies are gone. Can you start later in life uh, in Absolutely. a field as this? Absolutely. No problem. Absolutely. One thing I also want to mention is that mm -hmm. the program at Mercyhurst created something called the Great Lakes Intelligence Initiative in which we reached out to entities in this region. And we did strategic studies for those companies. And in some cases, what the product that we produced for them turned them around as far as where they were headed in the way of products and opportunities. So the program also has contributed locally as well as nationally and internationally. Thank you so much for taking a half hour out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. Thank you for all the good information. I've gotten in touch with Jim Breckenridge. I'm going to mention I talked to you. And of course, you can say hello to Lindy Jo Smart. She did an excellent interview. We'll pair that up with your interview yes, here. Thank you, John. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.